Listeners be advised, the Holiloquy podcast discuss matters related to the human experience and many that are sexual in nature. Due to this, some conversations may surround triggering topics such as sexual violence, self-harm, abuse, and much more. Please be advised, a list of crisis and psychological resources will be available in the show notes of this episode. With that said, let's get started with the show. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention please as we go through the following safety instructions. In the event that there is a loss of cabin pressure, oxygen mask will drop from the overhead. Place the mask over your nose and mouth. Breathe normally as oxygen is flowing even if the mask will not exist. Make sure to adjust your own mask before helping others. We're not going to talk about the fact that I have my microphone all the way up there. I I forgot that was right, like all the way up there. I'm just happy you were able to hear me before all of this. But anyways, <laughs> season two, and I'm still doing this shit. Okay, here we go. Here we go. All right. Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to the Whole Little We Podcast, where we step out and speak on sexuality. This is your favorite host, Vernon T. Scott, also known as Slater Jackson, and for you freaky motherfuckers out there, Sebastian Adams. On today's episode, we're talking about drunk sex. So uh, if you're out here drinking and all that good stuff and you're fucking, always remember that consent is important, that um, being inebriated does not really lead towards consent (laughs) um it does cancel out consent y'all so um be mindful of that whoever you engage with if you do decide to have drunk sex with the person please make sure it's somebody that you trust um one of the things that we highlight here is that when it does come to drunk sex um personal autonomy is a thing so people who do um do have it for the pleasure of it they're doing that with someone that they do trust um not everyone's worthy of that act uh, so keep that in mind if it's someone that you really do not trust or feel secure around do not engage uh and also remember drunk sex it does not always equal consent so yes on today's episode i have a podcast fave tyrell on the line and we're like i said we're talking about drunk sex but before we get into the nitty gritty gritty i don't know what the fuck i just said but before we get all into it i do want to give tyrell the um you know i forgot what i'm saying you know it's been a long day i'm sorry (laughs) but i do want to um give him a chance to just introduce himself since it is a new season um y'all can go back to the old episodes you know to get all the other information about this beautiful man but tyrell who the fuck are you yes hello hello to everybody if you are returning welcome back to season two we are bigger and better and so for anyone that is new, that are new viewers, and we hope that we have a lot of new viewers out there for, for, for my friend here. So I am, you know, Tyrell Collins. I, um, I have, I'm actually in my doctoral studies. I have a focus in uh, Black queer and trans rhetoric and, um, and studies. So that's a little bit, you know, about me. I, I have a background in uh, English and in writing. So I love to be here. I love to talk about uh, relationship and sex positivity and to get into, you know, drop some gems every now and then, you know, turn, you know, turn another year older, you know, recently, like I just, I feel more wise. That's I feel more. Wise. So, you know, if I can just impart a little bit about what I think or, you know, believe, and it happens to be something that makes you think a little bit differently, then that's all that, you know, we can ever, we can ever ask for. And, you know, I forgot to even text you. Thanks for the reminder. Happy belated birthday. Thank you. Thank you. I I remember you mentioned it on um, the the last recording that we did for November. And I was like, let me remember to send this mofo a text message. And I I forgot. I I, I clearly forgot. And look, look, you know, I don't know if your golden year is supposed to be your year of wisdom. or I don't really know technically what it's actually supposed to be. But I feel like I feel like I'm in that space. So, Mm -hmm. look, 
this is the best year. This is like the best year for me as far as like advice. They better get it out of me while you can. <laughs> Look, I swear, like that that twenty five to thirty. I, I'm not, I'm not at my thirties yet. Well, by the time this airs, I will be thirty. But all all of it has been a blur. Like. I know I've enjoyed most of it outside of, you know, 2020 foolishness and pandemic shit. But outside of that, I really have been enjoying that 25 to 30s um, gray area. And I call it the gray area because I be forgetting my age all the time. I just know I'm not 30 yet. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, the thing is, like, a lot of people ask me how I feel about being 29. And the thing is, is that, you know, being on that cusp of 30, I think because of where I am in my studies, because I will be finished, hopefully finished with my studies within the next couple of years and, you know, moving on to the job market and, you know, hopefully getting my own place and things like that. So I'm actually looking forward to my 30s. Like my 20s were OK, but, you know, like brother is tired of like being like financially unstable. So, you yes. know, even, so I'm tired. So I'm looking forward to moving into a new phase of my life that hopefully I'm not saying it's going to be an all smooth transition, but looking to come into a new era, if you would say, of just, you know, establishing my own personal space and who I want in that space, who I yes. don't want in that space. So, you know, it's it, it, I'm looking for I'm looking forward to 30. Look, um, the way like me and Shane, we had this conversation uh, a while yeah. back is that we're both leaning into 30s so that we can um, get our 30s glow on. So we can have that glow for the entire decade, because look, 35 is great. That's like an upgrade period. But you got to come into that that glow strong. And I was mm. telling her, look, I missed the, um, you know, that 21 year old glow. And I kind of skipped into like the 25 year old glow. But for 30, oh no, I'm preparing myself. I'm going to make sure this is that good as decade. Mm-mm, we're not playing those fucking mm. games. So yeah, right. go ahead and get your prep work in order so you can go ahead and lead into your 30 glow just as great. Yes. Look, we're going we're gonna to shine throughout the entire decade. Fuck what everybody exactly. else says. <laughs> like 30s, 30 is gonna be the come up decade. Like exactly. Like I'm here, world. Like exactly. Now, did you drink anything for your birthday? I I didn't. You know, I'm not really a celebratory kind of person. Mm-hmm. So you know, I really don't like really make a big fuss about my birthday. So really, I you know, I was actually with um with my mom, which was you know always good. And we actually did something that's kind of like a little tradition for us. We just went to get ice cream. I haven't Aww. had like a banana split in banana split in like such a long time. So you know, just got a little ice cream, and you know, I just you know chilled out. I didn't need to you know do anything. Oh, that's so adorable. I love it. I love it. See, <laughs> for my birthdays, I just call off work and um, pretty much don't do anything but I would say as of like 2016 ish I decided that I'm just gonna if I can take like the entire week off and just go somewhere and just do Mm. that's like my self-care time yes yes like yeah I have like all types of like like little small ideas like I would want to do for like a birthday like a like a maybe like a retreat or you know like something Mm. like that something that is you know like low-key but like I get to like you know just go somewhere a small trip or something you know but um but yeah usually I don't need to you know do anything too much I just you know I'm blessed to see another year of life amen see I know for my 30th, because I've been looking at prices, too, because I was like, let me go out of the country or something like that. I don't understand why it's so uh, expensive outside in February. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like what are we doing? <laughs> no, and, that, and that's the thing, like, because my birthday is always during, like, hurricane season, it's like, damn, <laughs> mm. <laughs> like, travel to some places. I'm yeah. like, shit. It's wild, mm. but I, I, you know, Still gonna get that little good self care going on, but yes, always, always. I, I know I'm 35, and that's that's what that's definitely going to have you. So mm-hmm. <laughs> now to get into the episode, um, uh, like I said, we are talking about drunk sex. Do you have any like personal connections with alcohol, or have you ever had uh, drunk sex in the past? Anything like that? Um, I haven't, but I know a lot of people who have. Mm. And yeah, the the thing about drunk sex is that, you know, I heard like a psychologist one time, she's, she was saying that 
even if you are in the confines of like a relationship that, you know, two people cannot consensually consent to sex when you're, when you're impaired. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it's kind of like on the cusp, I kind of agree and don't agree all at the same time, Mm -hmm. because I think everybody's intoxication level is very different and there are other factors. So for me, I think that the base of it is, is that if you still cannot operate in the nature of consent and check in when you are inebriated or drunk, then you should not be having sex. Agreed. So, so yeah, I'm not going to say like, oh, like just because like we're maybe dating or we're in a relationship that, you know, like just because we're drunk doesn't mean like we can't consent to sex. But if we know that, hey, I'm kind of out of it, you kind of out of it, we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't be engaging in sexual activity. Exactly. And, uh, ooh, you know, when the episodes just start mixing up, I think, uh, think this episode uh, releases well released in season one but like the conversation i had with shane about it um Mm. or was it with shane it was somebody but we were talking about how um like um this person had a friend who um was just like or was it their partner i forget all these conversations tend to blend together at one point but essentially because their partner uh saw them and they were just so uh, intoxicated they chose like I I know that you you know wanted to do this but because Mm -hmm. you're so drunk I don't feel comfortable with doing that and and that's I think that's something that goes on with the trust within relationships too uh, because they they recognize that oh my partner is way way too far gone um that I want them to be pleased, but I also want to be pleased with having sex with them. And because they are extremely drunk, I'm not going to do that because I'm going to be uncomfortable. I'm not going to be receiving any pleasure. And I'm going to feel as though I'm violating my partner if I were to continue to do that. And I think that's a a great balance to understand and know when it does come to those kind of situations with other people. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, it's one of those aspects that, yeah, like I said, you know, it, every, cause everybody is so, you know, individualistic. And I think that it mm-hmm. takes for somebody who is, you know, completely honest with you. And I think that even if you don't have a history of being what is known as like sloppily drunk, or, you know, like you're, you know, like you're cool, you know, you may have that one time where, you may lose a little bit of control and not even, and it's not even in the forefront of your mind. And you cross a line, you know, with somebody that, you know, now, you know, you got to deal with the consequences of potentially. So, you know, so I think, you know, it's kind of like one of those things, like, I think there was an article that had a question, like, can drunk sex ever really be ethical? Mm. You know, so it's like, even under the best, you know, kind of like circumstances, you know, what do we consider? And I think that that's another conversation, like, what do we consider the ethics around our sexual, you know, engagement, you know, and also, you know, and and this is such an important topic, because it's like, this is a good conversation to have with like potential daters or potential partners, like, if you know that you're going to be out, you know, having some drinks or whatever, you know, now, to me, I think like, hey, like, there's nothing wrong with, like, some drunk kisses, you know, like, some little neck action, or, you know, what have you, but, you know, it's kind of like that old school saying, we can only go to first, like, we can only go to first or second base, like, that we can't go to third base. <laughs> mm-hmm. Just, you know, put put the brakes on real quick, if you go yeah. too far. Like, you know, that. like, so, yes, because let's not pretend, like, you know, like, we're, we're nuns for any reason, you know, like, you know, <laughs> hey, when we're, you know, when we feeling it, you know, like, emotions get a little roused other things get aroused as well and you know hey you know we could you know be doing a little something but you know you just Mm -hmm. have to you just have to know when to have that cutoff period and if you know that you're someone that is like a lot of people say like i get really horny when i'm drunk the holiloquy podcast focuses on the variability of sexual expression When it comes to sexual expression, we often depend on pornography to illustrate how one must perform sexually. For those who have not learned this by now, the stuff you see in porn is not real. Pornography provides a singular perspective of sexual expression that is not often the reality we see during our own sexual encounters. 
The Holiloquy Podcast is a conversation that takes you outside of the compressed box of what many know about sex. Some of the topics we discuss include kinks, condom usage, status disclosure, and past sexual experiences. The Holiloquy Podcast steps out on sexual norms and recognizes that the norm is not the only normal. Subscribe today and join the conversation. Know that you're someone that is like a lot of people say, like, I get really horny when I'm drunk, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, if you know that you're that way and you know that you can't really control those urges, then you don't need to put yourself in a, you know, sexual situation, sexual situation. Mm. So. I, I like I like that you mentioned that, you know, when you get drunk, you get horny um, because, you know, some people um, they do not necessarily become a whole different person, but they they exude a different personality in a sense or uh, oh. a heightened personality. And for me personally, I feel as though the person you are while drunk is a thing that's been on your mind the longest yeah. <laughs> rather yeah. than the alcohol is making you this person. Uh, right. Right. And that's, and that's something that's very interesting because like, uh, I think she's a sexologist named Madeline Monroe. She said one time that, you know, like, uh, cause I think she, she's uh, based in like the UK and they, and basically they were saying because people are socialized in drinking at, you know, younger ages than, you know, of course we have here in the United States where, you know, it's illegal, um, that alcohol is like a kind of social lubr lubricant. I think that's the way that she phrased it, because for a lot of people, alcohol and sex go hand in hand. If you think about like how if you go to approach, let's just say, you know, old school, like, you know, you're going to like approach somebody at the bar or, you know, something like that. You've already sized them up, you know, sized them or looked them down, you know, physically. And, you know, like, oh, I'm sending, you know, I'm going to want to send this person a drink or, you know, like we're having, you know, two or three drinks and, you know, like, hey, you know, that can be a invitation for something else like so for a lot of people a drink is not really just just a drink mm. like they're expecting to get something out of it so yeah so for a lot of people in their mindset alcohol and sex go hand in hand that makes sense that really does make sense i didn't even think about it like that um the transactional things of our society the drink equals sex but mm. I, I i get it uh now that you brought that perspective, because even, um, you know, like the songs by, you know, buy you a drink and all the other shit, or even because um, like for me, if I were to just say alcohol is uh, is used as a social lubricant, I would have thought of in a way of build, bringing conversation to like right. a, a few people, um, like whenever you see like on TV shows and uh, mm -hmm. they, you know, slide the um, drink down to the edge of the bar and they're just like, oh, it's on this person over here. And, you know, they go right. over there and get to know them. But at the same time, it is with the intention, intention yeah. to start yeah. fucking later on. So. Exactly. And in fact, one of uh, a f actually a favorite show of mine that used to come on the channel Freeform, I actually stopped watching after they... I think really like mishandled the nature of like a, you know, kind of drunk uh, sex, you know, kind of story mm -hmm. um, that I really did not like between like these two characters who were friends at one point. They dated, you know, it didn't work out, but something happened at the party and it's not to take anything away from women or their what they innately feel but the reason why I had a problem with this storyline was because this main character who is a woman like you know this friend of yours this is not somebody you just met mm -hmm. and it's not to say like things cannot happen with people that you you know that you don't know so I'm definitely not saying that but the reason why I thought why I did not like the writing of it is because you were also inebriated as well so you really don't know what happened she woke up the next morning and she fell off and I'm not taking anything away from that you know you always mm -hmm. listen to your body but you have no proof of anything or you know like all you have is really just what's going on inside you like you have that feeling but it's kind of like you know her friend he got kicked out of school he got demonized you know by his friends over something that you don't really know what happened mm. and that's the thing I had about the problem with the writing of this story was not because of the fact that you know she you know felt something or you know she 
uh, you know, didn't follow her instincts, but you're following your instincts when your instinct could really be wrong and you're ruining this man's reputation, you know, because it's not like you, you know, you were conscious mm. of it. And now, you know, it's just so it's just it was a really complicated storyline, but it's just I really did not like the the way it was it was handled. You know, it was kind of one of those stories that it really tended to be one sided. And at the conclusion of it, you still don't know what happened. And so mm-hmm. that's just a PSA message. It's kind of like if you don't even want to question about what happened, don't put yourself into the situation. Like that. I get that. I, I definitely get that because one of the conversations, I, um, this was actually within um, a workshop I did um, back when I was in housing. Um, we were, uh, it was a consent workshop and uh, we were. Uh, talking about the drunk sex situation and someone brought up the uh, question about well what if we're we're both completely drunk and Mm. I literally told them then you technically sexually assaulted each other (laughs) like Mm. um, because uh, at the end of the day neither one of you could give consent now on from a legal standpoint uh, there would be the give and take of who was the most drunk or uh, who was the most um aware of everything that's going on but the rules that be on the books most of the time is if you have a drop of alcohol in your system then you're you're unable to give consent depending on what state you're in Mm -hmm. so it's like in those situations the the there's no true justice in a way because both individuals are intoxicated and to place the blame on one entity um like you were saying with the Mm -hmm. the the dude in this situation um where Mm -hmm. he has to be the person that gets kicked out ostracized demonized and all of that is unfair to him because uh because he doesn't know what happened and neither does she know what happened and granted yes if you do feel uncomfortable um that is a proper time to you know if you want get a rape kit or all of that to give you some clarity of what happened that night if there are some traces of um semen look into the room were there condoms taken out all of these things are important to know um prior to just saying this person raped me and even in those uh situations to just say okay you're uh because this has happened to some uh male college students and uh mm-hmm. i hate that for them too um because one yes believe victims uh especially you have to um uh, believe women too since uh when it does come to sexual assault people don't believe women at all uh or right. women don't often get the justice that they deserve when they do report so that there is a, a necessity in that but in these types of situations, there is so much nuance and so much, th- so many things you have to discuss to figure out what happened. Even um, taking it to like therapy, uh, if there's some kind of uh, hypnosis therapy that might help bring back those memories, whatever is possible, utilize that. Mm. But to just have that, oh, okay, this happened. They were both drunk, suspected sex or actual sex. Now they're both out it's hard to really say that was truly a sexual assault. Uh, well, you can say it's a sexual assault, but in the context of both people being drunk, that means yeah. both have to get kicked out. Exactly. It's not exactly one party holds all the fault in that situation. Yeah. And, and, yeah. Like, even on top of that, because, you know, uh, alcohol is the number one date rape drug. It mm. is also a date rape drug that's used by women, too. It's not just yeah. men who do it. Women Absolutely. use um, alcohol to intoxicate, like get men more intoxicated in order to have sex. It does mm-hmm. happen. It, it. I don't know. I could say it happens in a less amount. Well, in terms of there's a disproportionate, you know, uh, dis- disproportionate uh, perpetration that is, you know, mainly men, but in terms of use of alcohol in that perpetration of sexual assault, I don't know for sure. It wasn't in my research. Probably should have looked into that. But women do use that as a, a mm-hmm. means to, you know, uh, have sex with men too. So, right. yeah. Yeah. And that's why I, I ultimately say, you know, it is also, you know, individualistic. And that's why, you know, that's why you have the sayings of, 
you know, you need to know how to hold your liquor, Mm -hmm. you know, and things like that, because we're all built differently. Our systems are all different. And like, I know for myself, just speaking, I'm, I'm a shorter guy. I'm five, three. And so I know for myself, I, well, one, I don't never like to engage in much drinking when I'm out anyway, but two, I don't necessarily know how my body is going to respond to the nature of alcohol because, you know, something that, you know, I'm just going to say a taller person who's like six feet, you know, can, can handle because we know that in alcohol, when alcohol gets into your bloodstream, there is a lot of physiologic, uh, physiological things that happen, you know, with the nature of consumption of alcohol. So what you can handle, I may not be able to handle, you know? So, and I, and I think that everybody should get to a place where, you know, you, you know what you feel comfortable with. And I know for me, it's like when I'm out, I'll have maybe two, two drinks, you know, and, you know, at most, maybe three, but it definitely goes no past than three, Mm. you know, because I don't like to drink to be drunk. I actually don't find any fun in being drunk. You know, I like to drink, as I say, like to get me a little buzzed, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but I don't actually, you know, like being drunk. So I can only count me. I can only count maybe two times in my life. I've actually been drunk. I get you there. I'm pretty much the same way. Like I, I like, I like my buzz and I I will have Mm -hmm. to say this people know your limits. Definitely Mm -hmm. know your limits. Uh, Like you said, you know, three drinks, you good. You got your buzz going on life is great i know like for myself i have a very high tolerance uh, except for wine because wine drunk is a whole nother drunk oh my god (laughs) the the magic of wine it it baffles me like i i don't i don't be knowing what the hell is going on like that taylor porter yes taylor love you girl but i'm like when it comes to liquors i can have like three shots be good um probably might have a mixed drink in that and life is great i have a buzz going on i'm feeling good i'm cognizant of everything that's going on Mm -hmm. i can party i can still party i can have fun but i also don't try try to get myself to a point where one i have to get an uber two i have to um call somebody to pick me up three right okay i've gotten drunk um throw up drunk way too many times in my life and still been able to you know move like maneuver and live life or whatever but i try not to get that drunk but i i i I personally do not like that feeling either um Mm -hmm. of being so drunk that you don't know where up is down and what's down is up left and right it's all fucked up i i can't do it i can't do it i like to be in a mindset where i can move i know what's going on i feel secure in myself and i'm just lighthearted. i'm feeling good i'm relaxed and Mm -hmm. i'm thinking about when i'm going to take this damn nap that that's where i like to be when it comes to like being out here and drunk Yeah. And, and, you know, and also what I have found, like, well, not found, but, you know, have, you know, read about the correlation of alcohol and sex in particular is that some people, you know, they will use drunk sex as a means of like, that's the standard for them, Mm. especially like when you're when you're young and you're just finding out, you know, like about, you know, know, like your sexuality and things like that. Like some people have ultimately admitted, like they don't necessarily, you know, like if they're not engaged in sex, like consistently as in the confines of like a relationship, the only times where they may have sex is during like drunk encounters, because one, they don't see it as a problem because Mm -hmm. they're not, you know, out here, you know, like sleeping with just anybody. But when they do, it provides them, you know, all those things that, you know, alcohol is supposed to, you know, that is supposedly in air quotes provide Mm -hmm. like that sense of release of inhibition. Drunk sex has, you know, some people have said like it helps them, you know, get over the anxiety that they have about engaging in intimacy with another person. And I know like for me, it's just like the complete opposite. Because if I'm like inebriated, like I'm just going to be like, <laughs> like what, what's going on? Like what's going on? So for me, I have the opposite. But, you know, I do know for a lot of people that they actually prefer to have drunk sex. Mm-hmm. And yeah, there, there, there is a good number of people who really do prefer drunk sex. Like, um, and there's those who um, also cannot get it up or 
uh, initiate or even be involved in a sexual experience while being drunk because their body needs it so much just to get them aroused. Right. Um, so like for those people who, you know, have conditioned their bodies to that, I challenge them to think about, um, you know, their sexual experience with themselves. If they do have like masturbatory um like sex with themselves like if you're out here masturbating and do you have to drink in order to get yourself off or are you able to do it freely um that is something to really think about because look when when we're raised in a society where binge drinking is considered the norm then Mm. it's hard to like think otherwise in terms of like how you express your sexuality because one i have to go out party get drunk, get wasted, and then find somebody to hook up with and then go have sex with them. And that's not a healthy choice for a lot of people. (laughs) Yeah. And even just like when you're meeting people or you like you're in certain friend groups, because let's be, let's be honest, like, you know, I, I was, I was actually a spoken word um, poet for one of the years of Take Back the Night that we had um, at my, you know, when I was in college. And Take Back the Night was centering on um, helping people who, especially women and children, who have been, you know, obviously um, abused in some sort of, you know, fashion. And of course, men are included in that too, but, you know, of course, that doesn't get talked about as much. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that uh, was commonly going on, and mind you, being at HBCU, so of course, around, you know, a good plethora of Black women who were sharing their stories, And what was such a disconnect that I saw from people from other universities that were sharing their stories and, you know, the women that were, you know, coming to my university is that, you know, they were having the thing about like, what, like, we we have a buddy system, Mm -hmm. but it's like when you're having to find the right friends to trust, because like a lot of the women like that were in my psychology class, they were flabbergasted about some of these stories, not the fact that it happened once, but that, uh, you know, alcohol-induced rape or drug rape happened to some, you know, women several times, you know, like, it has happened on very multiple occasions, and so, you know, it just got to the conversation about, like, no, when I'm with, out with my friends or whatever, we came together, so we're leaving together, mm-hmm. like, if you want to go and hook up with somebody, y'all can arrange that for another night, but as long as you're with me or in my presence, if we came together, rest assured, we're going to lead together. Amen to that. You know, so, uh, yeah, so it's kind of like some, of, and I even had, you know, kind of like was taken aback about South, particularly for, you know, certain women as they were sharing their stories. Like, okay, I get it, you know, that, you know, misjudgment, you know, happened. Um, but the fact of the matter is that when it, it happened repeatedly, hmm. You know, and so it's kind of like when you do happen to say that, you know, you were a victim to, to this or you were a survivor of this, what do you do to ensure that you're not in that type of situation again? Mm. You know, because it's kind of like if you haven't learned any, not necessarily learned anything from it, but if you haven't been given the tools and the skills to deal with what um, led up to this situation transpiring then what do you have? And a lot of times when it comes to alcohol, one of the first signs of being um, assaulted or, you know, almost being assaulted is the nature of coercion, Mm -hmm. you know, especially if you're not familiar with drinking or, you know, particular alcohol or things like that, you don't know how your body is going to react. And that's part of the reason why I don't engage in certain substances. Like I'm not, you know, just speaking, you know, for myself, I'm not a drug user. Mm-hmm. You know, and, you know, one, because I don't have any interest in doing any kind of even recreational drugs, but everybody's bodies react very different. So, again, something you may drink or may be doing, I could have an entirely different reaction to it. Hey, that's true. You know, so, yeah, it's just one of those things that you just you have to you just have to take accountability and ownership of yourself because you are the only one that has autonomy over your body and if you are inebriated and you are in a dangerous situation you're not going to have that anymore and that's a uh, that is an unfortunate truth and I, I just have to say this just for um mm-hmm. someone who might be thinking otherwise but this is not a way of blaming the victim 
no. uh, in any way. Uh, it's no. more of, because even whenever I have conversations with people in terms of like accountability and whatnot, it's not saying that that person's at fault of another person's actions upon them. Because that's not true. That person, the perpetrator, is the person who made them a victim. That was their actions that done that. Um, now, um, the opposite side of that is that, hey, in this moment, these are my actions that uh, I've participated in that may have made it to me being more vulnerable. Then I need to figure out a way to, you know, protect myself in order to you know keep myself from being in that position once more and the analogy I like to use for some people is whenever someone leaves a door unlocked or leave leave a door completely open that means um uh whoever wants to rob the house they could just walk up in there and steal things now at the end of the day the person who robbed the house is the person who needs to go to jail. The owner is technically not at fault because, look, they left the door yep. open, but that does not give anybody the right to enter because exactly. it's their home. That's their private uh, house. You should not be entering in anybody's home that you're not invited to. Exactly. So, again, that person's responsible for their actions. Now, on the flip side, the owner of the house, the lesson that not saying that you learn a lesson from um, being victimized, but the 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 end message is, okay, maybe to prevent this from happening in the future, remember to close my door a little bit more often or have right. cameras or something to patrol just in case someone decides to violate my home mm -hmm. in the future. Exactly. Again, they're not the uh, cause of their victimization. They're not the cause of somebody robbing them that was the action of somebody who wanted to do that because that mm. was their intentions in their mindset to do so yes yeah and just know that you know again this is not about you know blaming you know blaming victims or survivors by any means like no one has the right to violate you in any type of of circumstance and what I just want people to know is that you want to just try to always make the best decisions for yourself, exactly. um, you know, when those when those things happen, because even when you're out with people that you, you know, that you love and that you trust, it's kind of one of those things. Like I say, at the end of the day, I trust me, <laughs> you know, more than, any, you know, more than anyone, more than anyone else. And I don't know, I think for me, having a little bit, I'm not going to say like outwardly social anxiety, but you know, I don't like to be in big, you know, necessarily like to be in big crowds, you know, a lot of times, uh, even with uh, being in bar spaces, like I'll go to a bar, I'll have a nice time, you know, whatever. But usually I don't like being in bar spaces too much because I'm like, I can't never hear myself, you know, speak because I'm not like a loud speaker. But, um, but yeah, so it's kind of like, you know, except for maybe lounges or anything that has more of a more relaxed atmosphere, um, definitely take stock into where you're going mm. and being served alcohol mm. obviously if you are you know uh drinking any type you know if you're engaging in any type of alcoholic beverages keep track of you know how many drinks that you're having mm. of course because it's very easy to lose track of that it you is. know and especially if you're with someone who are you know they're buying the drinks and stuff like that so it's not on my dime <laughs> you know? uh, so you know that's a real easy you know thing so there's just a lot of there's a lot of little things that go on in social settings when it comes to drinking that can happen very instantaneously and before you know it mm -hmm. you know you can be in a situation that you really don't want to be in or even just having the scare of it you know because a lot of near misses you know have happened and and, and speaking particularly to, um, you know, queer, especially um, queer men of color, um, the nature of assaults not being, you know, necessarily mm -hmm. taken as seriously or, you know, things like that, that, you know, to recognize that you, you, do you, do you want to be put in positions where, you know, you have to defend yourself being inebriated, mm -hmm. you know, as well, because yeah, definitely sexual assault takes place in, in our communities of, you know, queer, uh, you know, men of color communities, you know, at alarm, at more alarm, not necessarily more alarming rates, but it's definitely at alarming rates that, you know, do not get talked about. I agree. You know, as much. So. <clears throat> yeah, they, uh, it is 
definitely rape in general, sexual assault in general is underreported. Um, and it does happen. And then when, when you do report and it's a sad truth of, you know, cause this is where we live in society today that it, you will be blamed regardless of your sexual mm-hmm. assault as in why were you with this guy? Why were you drunk with this guy? You know how men are. And mm-hmm. um, it's like, but I'm, I'm here with you. I'm, I'm telling you about my traumatic experience and hoping to get support, but at the end of the day, you're not going to get it. Uh, and then mm-hmm. for depending on who you report it to, they might have the mindset that, oh, you're queer you're a sin um therefore you got what you deserved sinners Mm -hmm. you know punished that was your punishment for doing what you're doing living the lifestyle that you're living and extremely unfair um now one of the things because you you touched base on it earlier and uh this is also something i want i wanted to address too um Mm -hmm. before i ended up into the episode and that is how um, some people engage in drunk sex as a coping me- uh, mechanism or to re-traumatize themselves. Um, right. And I, uh, I don't know if this is something that has been researched. I probably should look into a little bit more, but I've uh, had conversations with some friends uh, about who've been victims of sexual assault um, through by means of uh, alcohol um, and they also enjoy drunk sex and mentally i'm like okay why are you putting yourself back into a position where you might fall into that same predicament that you were before uh and of course i've over the years i've also learned that sometimes you should not ask a direct question like that (laughs) to people but you know uh but that uh brought me on the concept of how people do repeat cycles based off of whatever traumatic experience that they had. Uh, mm-hmm. and some people do that as a way to gain power when they lost that power from somebody else. And some right. also do that in order for them to punish themselves for allowing themselves to be in that predicament to begin with. But the only thing here is that they're making the choice to be punished that way. Exactly. Um, So what are your thoughts on that? No, absolutely. Um, Definitely alcohol is used for many types of coping mechanisms. And it can even stem from obviously, you know, stemming from being very little. You know, you may have seen, you know, parents or guardians, you know, um, in abusive or, you know, toxic situations. Um, And Lord forbid, if, you know, if you are were in a situation where, you had an intoxicated adult around you and you were obviously the person that was singled out, you know, um, in this instance to be violated, you know, so any type of violation is, you know, it it goes on so many levels. Mm -hmm. And I think particularly with alcohol, it's not something that just instantly happens. It's something that I think progresses uh, in, you know, uh, and I should, I, let me actually reword this. It's something that, um, it starts out as, you know, if you're drinking, you know, you may say some off the cuff things, your words are starting to slur or whatever, but it's like this very gradual, you know, progression. It's not a lot of times I think, and I don't know, you know, personally for myself, but I don't think that sometimes a lot of times like assault just like instantly happens. I think that it's a gradual progression. And you have to deal with each um, each thing that has happened in that gradual, you know, progression of not feeling safe in this moment. And then if this person is coming towards me or has forced themselves on me, I have to deal with not just the physical implication of that, but the mental of it, the emotional of it, you know, and all of these kind of um, and all of these kind of aspects. And so, yeah, I think that and we can repurpose that, mm-hmm. you know, and especially into teenage and adulthood where we are using the nature of alcohol to escape, just not feeling. You know, some people use alcohol to feel something and some people, they use it as a coping mechanism as not to feel something, Mm -hmm. you know? So um, it just, you know, it really is just, you know, obviously individual and, you know, neither neither one obviously is healthy at all, you know, so. Agreed. Well, I'll say that has been a wonderful conversation. So it's been a while. 
Uh, and, you know, of course, I still have my books and my cards. So I'm going to start up that would not would you rather never have I ever. We're going to start off with that. Uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll probably do a would you rather in a sense question. We'll see what we we'll see. What, it's all depending on time. All right. You ready? Mm-hmm. Ooh, OK. Never have I ever read an erotic novel. I have. OK. And what was the name of it? I have um, the erotic novels that I have read actually come from like very like classic um like black erotica, like Zane. Yes. Um, yes, I was a fan of like the Zane Sex Chronicles yes. and everything. Yeah, so I, I really did enjoy Zane. Like, I, and you know, the thing is, is that um, I kind of like have a little bit of a bias because um, being a writer myself, I always feel like they always showcase like the black erotica, like in like regular stores and, you know, stuff like that more than they showcase like classic, you know, black literature and things like that. So that's my own personal problem. But, um, that's a good point. but you know, it's, but it's kind of like, as I go through like the shelves and I'll be seeing like all of this, you know, black erotica, I'm like, this is all like almost the same, just a different author slapped on the title, on the titles of it, because there is nothing that no, I'm not going to say nothing because obviously I have not read, but it's just even from the cover or from the mm. titles of the work and stuff like that. It's every all black erotica is really all put into this, you know, kind of heteronormative, you know, space, mm. you know. And so it's like, well, where is the you know, where is the black erotica that is talking about maybe a woman who has maybe had, you know, traditionally, a, you know, relationships with men, but, you know, maybe she's, you know, having feelings for like her, be- you know, like her best friend or, you know, something, that, something that's just different. Or um, like I, uh, for a book club that I um, belong to, I, um, we read recently um, the uh, collection story of, um, oh, I cannot, I cannot remember the name, but we read a collection story that was called um, The Gilda Story, The Gilda Stories, mm-hmm. and that, you know, that particular, um, you know, it is considered to be Black lesbian vampire erotica, <laughs> like all of that, like all of that, you know, kind of set into the nature where it's not anything that is overly done. You know, it's like you want, you know, you follow this mythology, but it's very much rooted in deep, you know, African spirituality as well. You know, so it's harnessed in real life, but you follow this woman, Gilda, as she is learned, you know, she's turned into a vampire. You follow her throughout like so many hundreds of years of her life. She does have, um, you know, relationships with, you know, men and women. And when we had our book club meeting, one of the interesting concepts about the conversation we had that you really don't see in a lot of mythology comes from the nature of what makes someone turn someone else into a vampire or someone else into another creature that was a staple of the gilda stories and so i'm not going to get off on tangent on that but i am here to say like that black erotica i just wish we had more encompassing stories because there are ones that are out there we just need to get them on the shelf See, we need to get them on the show. Uh, again, he's he dropping words. I don't know if we even gonna get into other stuff because now we're talking about literature. First, let me answer. Yes, I have read <laughs> um, <laughs> erotic novels. I love them. Zane yeah. is my girl. Love her. It, so I agree because I walked past the because uh, I was in Walmart. Um, cool. This well, the memory I'm connecting to right now I was in Walmart and I was looking at all the covers and I'm like all these fucking covers are the same uh are all I'm not even trying to even look at or read these books because one I granted the interior of it may be completely different (laughs) but at the same time I'm not trying to read something that's like copy and paste. I don't want that. Right. I want things that give me true storyline. And that's the one thing I love yeah. about Zane is because like for me, right. I, I personally, this might not be true. Uh, I have not dug into the research this much, but I personally feel as though the only reason why erotica exists uh, in the sense, you know, like with Zane as a writer is for Black romance novelists because yeah. 
all of her actual stories outside of like the uh, Sex Chronicles, um, Black her flavor flavor books and whatnot. Those were ro- romance novels that just say dick mm-hmm. and pussy and clit. That's the only right. difference between anything right. else. Um, there, um, the writing of Zane was not using flowery language like oh I um breath in the roses of her bush like nobody cares about that just say you will smell right. her pussy it's all it's right. okay right. like right. that's it's, okay. <laughs> it's cool <They're> just pretty plain <laughs> ain't it but like um whenever I do go to bookstores or even shop online for other books I really miss the wow factor of books or even um, things that make you want to turn the cover. Like, I don't really like too many books that have people on them anymore. Like, it's always the same looking couples. I don't want that. Like, I, I will rather, like, Skyscraper by Zane. It's a, the cover has a whole skyscraper on it. Exactly. <laughs> you wouldn't know that book is about sex. Like, you know, the writer, you know, um, her you know history and what kind of uh, content she produced but at the end of the day the the cover it was phenomenal it was was good it was still a good book nowadays i don't find any books that i truly connect with you do need to send me uh that artist that uh, author by the way because i i love me some vampires i love me some blackness i love it all so send that shit to me i love lesbian straight all that gay queer i love it all send that shit to me but like there's no space for revolutionary black artists, uh, well, revolutionary black writers on bookshelves these days. And that is horrible because I know like a lot of um, black authors these days go the indie route because of the stories that they tell and how um, it's so outside of the norm of what the basic American society will want us to be, you know, to in, uh, dive into. So oh. I, I think that's that's one of the things that I hate so much <laughs> when I go to yeah. like looking for books or things like that. Because there was a point in time where I will go, I will spend twenty dollars every month to get a new book. Um, oh. Did I read them all? Not really. Did I read some? Yes. But nowadays, it's just like there's nothing that really entices me like i do like you said there's no uh, real spaces for contemporary um black writers um i would love to see it yeah and you know the thing is i think and i just actually sent you you know kind of like that link i did remember you know for any audience that you know is interested the book that i was referencing the title for it's called the gilda stories by jewel gomez you can it's very you know searchable it's on Amazon and, you know, uh, Barnes and Nobles and a lot of other places. And what really surprised me was that, like, this wasn't anything that is, like, new, like very new. Like, this came out in 1991. And the fact that, you know, we are able to follow this, you know, um, Black, like, lesbian, you know, type, you know, Black lesbian character, you know, through the nature of something that's steeped in real history but also mythology as well i'm like yes let's get it but the reason why these kind of works don't get talked about as much or they don't get their due credit is because i think a lot of times and i'm finding this out you know as i'm talking about you know my writing and publishing and things like that hopefully into the future i'm trying to manifest that um (laughs) you know that um a lot of times people will tell, you know, especially authors of color, like your work doesn't have a space in mainstream, in, you know, mainstream media. And so it's kind of like, like I heard one time I was at, you know, an annual writers conference, like one of the gentlemen who was sharing his author's journey, he said that, you know, his agent uh, told him that his book would not be able to sell because uh, you could not have a black boy a a black boy who was book smart and street smart Mm. like what the hell is that (laughs) a slap in the face (laughs) really (laughs) so and actually you know like he was saying his like agent sound like wanting him to like change the character or whatever it's like no (laughs) like absolutely not like and of course he got his break at you know some point but like to you know for mainstream to tell you about what stories are going to sell Mm-hmm. is, you know, really like a cop-out. And yeah, it may be from a more business, you know, kind of mindset and perspective, but 
that's why I always want to amplify artists and telling the stories that you want to tell, because the mm -hmm. stories you tell are really a reflection of not just necessarily your life, but your family's life, your friend's life, or, you know, stories that you hear that go on around you. And it's yes. like that classic thing. If we don't tell our stories, no one, you know, we leave it to the devices of other people. Exactly. Do, you know, so. Like, this, this is another reason why I love, like, indie uh authors and it's oh. it's kind of hard to find uh indie art authors too because you know independent um but like um in that space uh of like going traditional publishing and a lot of people don't know this but they have once you give them the rights to your story they can change that story however they want to make the money that they want and it can mean removing characters or it can mean changing the storyline editing uh, important scenes out of it, whatever it is that they feel as though is going to sell and keep people coming back to, uh, you know, purchase from you, um, buying your books, they're going to take it out. And oh. there's a point where you have to have that integrity of, hey, I understand that this is um, your business, but this is the story I want to tell. Uh, and this is the way I, uh, I want to tell it. Outside of giving constructive criticism um different avenues making sure the grammar and syntax and all that and formatting is correct there i don't feel as though there needs to be a section within traditional publishing that makes you have to change up the mm. the essence of your story at all exactly and then i think also a little bit of the hesitancy about writing erotica Mm -hmm. is like the pushback that you know you'll get from yes. you know just in case your book is wanting to get into schools or you know in library shelves I mean like hey a lot of authors are facing you know censorship and banning and you know things yeah. like that and it's kind of like when you think about it, it's like do do I really want to go through the fight of it and you know and I make you know I I try to pass you know as less judgment as I can I'm not going to say you know oh, you should put up the fight for it. You know, that's really people's own personal choice. But for those that do know that, you know, oh, it's going to be an upheaval battle and it's mm -hmm. going to take like what is happening with um, like author uh, George M. Johnson for, you know, their, their um, novel Black, uh, um, All Boys Aren't Blue, mm. you know, is, has been going through a lot of censorship and banning and, you know, yeah. things like that. And the fact that they have been fighting out against it and just recently it was reported that one of the schools that tried to ban it, the students stood up and said that, no, we don't want banned literature. We want access to this literature. Mm -hmm. And I think from George's perspective, which I have heard them speak about, you know, this wasn't just a, 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 a you know, a piece of literature, you know, just to talk about and move on. This could, you know, really help, you know, save young queer kids of color's lives. Yes. And, you know, like they could find something in themselves. And so, yeah, you know, it's, it's one, yeah, it's just, just such a shame. But yeah, th that's the nature of the erotica though. And when, like you say, when you talk about language, you know, and things like that, what language is um, acceptable mm -hmm. or uh, academically inclined to, use, you know, use exactly. or just within the public sphere or settings. Yeah, it's going to create problems. Exactly. It's going to create problems. Like... We, we, we gotta get off this topic but i, I, I do have yeah. like even when it comes to like for my own book uh and for those who have not gotten a copy show notes is there the essential guide how to be all all that great okay yeah. whatever Download. But, yep. <laughs> but with that with that uh with my book just the i did it on purpose yes to um to trigger people in terms of oh my god what kind of book is this but also figure out what kind of book it is and there's been so many people just like even in my family who I've shared the book to for free or even they know that I wrote it they write the story of the book without even opening the first page in the oh. book like literally within the first pages you find out exactly what the book is about and what it's not about right. <laughs> it is like you right. have to actually open it to really understand what this book can do for you what uh, what it actually is about and um like just to say oh this book is going to really teach me how to be out here on these streets and hoeing with people you oh. already missed it you already failed the assignment yeah 
Yeah. So basically, you know, people read read you some erotica if you have it. It could be one. It could be do wonders for you. It surely can. Now, um, I do want to do a would you rather, uh, okay. and then we can close it out. So, would okay. you rather uh, have a lover who is slow, gentle, and can last for hours, or have a lover who's passionate and energetic but can only last a few minutes? Ooh. Ooh. Okay. Uh. So. Okay. So. Option one was slow, gentle, can last for hours. Mm-hmm. Uh, two is passionate, excited, but only for a short short time. Um, I'm going to go with the first option just because that's kind of more my speed. Mm-hmm. Uh, I may not necessarily last for hours, so, you know, sort of saga, but I am much more of a more gentle, slow, you know, sensual kind of, you know, person. So I would definitely go with the first option. Uh, these kind of questions, my, I always have the same answer. Mm. Both of them. Because one, Both. sometimes I'm in the mood for something that's long lasting. Yeah. And other times I'm just like, look, we just need to go ahead and get this in and out and be good. You know, life good. is great. Oh. I cannot be out here having hour long sessions on a regular basis. I cannot. I'm sorry. I don't have that much time on my hand. I do live mm. for the day that I do have that much time on my hand that we could be out right. in this motherfucker for hours. But in this current moment, <laughs> <laughs> and I think because of the fact like I've never like been in relationships so I've never had like something like that is consistent I think maybe I would have a little bit of a mind change if like if I was having something consistent so it's like when I do have my intimate encounters now it's like oh yeah like I haven't you know been in this kind of space in like maybe a minute or you know something so yeah I can yeah I can see like maybe how my perspective would change if I was like in a consistent relationship where we're having sex you know fairly on a regular it would just be like okay we got a time this like okay this can only be like three days out the week or yes (laughs) exactly (laughs) like so hopefully by the time this episode airs I'm in a whole ass relationship with somebody we shall see how this goes look let's Give some Be things a try. Here. Ain't it? Like I, I do I do like a uh slow to rough or well slow to quick kind of session and soft soft gentle and then somewhere uh, in the midst, uh yeah, yeah. comes out of, out of nowhere and says danger, and then next thing you know, everything is like a whole different scene. We're in the hood and all this <laughs> other shit. Motherfuckers getting punched in the face. I'm joking, I do not punch do not punch my face. We got issues. <laughs> If that happens, this is my product. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> but you know, no, this, a little like, bit of choking or some shit, you know? you know. But anyways, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. <laughs> Absolutely. Always love, always love being here. Uh, do you have any last words that you'd like to share with the pod uh the family before we close I uh, close everything out? Uh, no, I think we talked about everything. Again, just want to say, as we talked about a lot about, you know, intoxicated or alcohol, you know, induced sex, you know, just really people out there just really make make the best decisions that you can for yourself in in those moments. Again, you are never um, at fault, you know, for anything, but do still take precautions and um, make sure that you're taking care of yourself. Amen to that. And also to pick it back off of that, no means no, yes means yes, and maybe does not mm-hmm. exist. It also means no. On that note, thank you all so much for listening to the Holy Loki podcast where we step out and speak on sexuality. Just in case no one else told you this today, you are beautiful. You are worthy of happiness and joy. You are enough and then some. You may not live up to the expectations of others, but that is okay. You are only required to walk in your own shoes. May each day you live lead you towards abundance. With that said, love you all and see you next episode. Bye! Thank you for listening to the Holiloquy Podcast, where we step out and speak on sexuality. You can subscribe to the podcast through your favorite podcasting app and find us on the web at www.holiloquy.com. That's www.h-e-a-u-x-l-i-l-o-q-u-y.com. Share the podcast with your friends and join the conversation.